So we just have now a series of flash presentations. Really excited to get to hear from more people from across our network about projects uh, they're working on either with SDSN USA or uh, in their institutions. I'll just run through very briefly and then hand it over to them to um, give you more details. So we'll start off with the Zero Carbon Action Plan overview and next steps from Elena Crete and Gordon McCord, and then move on to hear from the Zero Hunger, about the Zero Hunger Pathways Project Dialogue from Alicia Powers. Then we'll have a brief presentation on SDSN's SDG Academy, followed by a presentation on engaging community, faculty, and students through the University Alliance. And that's University with a C-I-T-Y, uh, from Gavin Luter at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And then finally, we'll hear from Alex Hineker uh, on voluntary reviews, what they are and why should we do one. Um, and that's an, uh, from Carnegie Mellon University. So uh, without further ado, we can jump right in. And I'll just say that these presentations um, connect directly with the uh, breakout sessions that we have this afternoon and, and hopefully will spark some conversation and thought that we can continue through the rest of our discussions to today. So with that, I'll hand over to Elena and Gordon. Thanks, Caroline. Can I get a screen share ability? You should have it already. Gotcha. All right, great. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Elena Crete. I'm going to try to very quickly explain a year's worth of work to you all in a couple of minutes. Um, so I work with SDSN and I run our climate and energy programming. And actually last year at the annual USA member meeting, we launched our zero carbon action plan project. Um, so following that meeting, we set out to chart a path for the US to seek deep decarbonization by mid-century from both a technical, so how do we change our infrastructure and our energy system, and also economic, so how is our spending and the job in the workforce going to change alongside that? And then what are the policies that we need to put in place specifically from our federal government to get us there? Um, so we actually developed a large consortium with almost 100 researchers, most of which were from SDSN USA, um, and we did a few deep dives into the highest emitting sectors. Um, so in the report, you'll find chapters on each of these sectors, looking at the technologies that are currently available, the innovations that we need to be seeking in the decades ahead, and also some specific policies for these sectors. Um, so I'm going to try to summarize the outcomes from the report in three main messages. Um, first, we did modeling exercise that proved that the transition is both technically and economically feasible. Um, our six scenarios that we modeled showed that the actual cost of the transition is only between 0.2 and 1.2% of GDP in the lead up to 2050. And as you can see by the chart on the screen here, um, per historical spending, that's relatively modest, showing that we definitely can do it, but it would just mean a drastic different kind of spending in the transition. Um, the second key message was that um, a just transition is also possible um, and manageable and affordable. Um, so we actually did an economic analysis on the pathways that we had um, developed with uh, Robert Pullen. Uh, and what we came up with was that the energy transition is actually a net job creator. So around 2.3 million jobs per year are potentially possible if we get on any one of these trajectories. And also in his analysis, we found that only a couple states are actually gonna be seriously impacted by the loss of fossil fuel jobs, which just makes the uh, creation of a just transition plan much more manageable and affordable when you're looking at it at that scale. And there's also an array of just transition policies in that chapter, um, also talking about uh, um, uh, the uh, gender and race differential in the traditional um, uh, energy sector and then some policies that we can use to adjust that moving forward. 
Um, and then the third key takeaway is that the federal government has a key role to play as far as leadership in leading the transition, but that we also need to bring in states and cities. Um, so this message of federalism and that this is like an uh, a, a multiple scale issue. Um, and then you'll find throughout the report a variety of policy recommendations. Um, I'll remind you that this was published just before the presidential election. So uh, one big exciting outcome is we now have President Biden, who has actually taken forward several of our higher level recommendations. We're back in the Paris Agreement. Um, the US has committed to getting to net zero by mid-century. And as we saw yesterday uh, with so Sonia Agawal on uh, the Biden transition team has seen our report and our, our recommendations are, are there. So some other exciting outcomes since we published in October. Um, one of our chairs, Vicky Arroyo, has been named the uh, Associate Administrator for the Policy at the EPA. So again, our policy recommendations getting directly into that administration. Um, also, our modeling work that uh, underlines our transition pathways has been published in the AGU Advances Journal, and that's already been cited 185 times and was only published a few weeks ago. Um, and also, so in December, Massachusetts published a roadmap to 2050, and the modeling work that underlied that was the same modeling work in our ZCAP report. So we're just seeing all this momentum building. And so we're looking forward to continuing this portfolio of work and starting to think about downscaling this ZCAP model um, in the future. So I'll just pass it over to Gordon to just do a quick synapse of what's coming next. Sure, thanks, Elena. Um, so I'll be very brief. What we're working on in San Diego and thinking about this as a model that might generate a template for other jurisdictions to follow accordingly is to, is to think about downscaling the ZCAP exercise to state or county or, or even more local jurisdictions where the rubber really hits the road on a lot of things like land use or building policy where jurisdiction doesn't sit at the federal level but sits, uh, sits at more devolved levels of government. Um, so, so in San Diego, we're working with the county government on a regional decarbonization framework, very much uh, following the idea of first a technical backbone that lays out a trajectory uh, for the energy system, the transport system, the buildings, what gets us to zero by 2050, but embedded inside trajectories for the state and trajectories for the country so that you're getting coherence across all of these scales. And when a local jurisdiction like a town of 30,000 people is writing a climate action plan, that climate action plan is coherent with something that makes sense in terms of a technical pathway for the county, for the state, and for the country that that, that, that town is in. So that's what we're working on in San Diego, bringing together a, a team not only of modelers, but also policy analysts so that you go from start to finish with modeling first, then to very specific policy recommendations on the county action plans that exist at, uh, at county or, or city level. We had a great conversation yesterday with our group. We had uh, folks from uh, SUNY Nupals, from Auburn, from Swarthmore, and from the University of Maine, and talked about what different universities are doing uh, at different scales. Uh, everyone was in agreement that from this San Diego work or other examples like Massachusetts that Elena referred to, we should be thinking about writing up a, uh, a template that any jurisdiction uh, around the country could, could start with in terms of how universities and local jurisdictions could collaborate in terms of moving uh, forward with, uh, with a local decarbonization plan. Uh, but that we, we should really focus in terms of uh, things like financing issues that uh, lots of local governments have questions on what where financing could come from for uh, decarbonization investments. Uh, and also questions on what liberal arts colleges can do. So there's a, there's a clear role articulated for the research universities, but what about the liberal arts colleges in terms of contributing to local decarbonization efforts? Uh, so that's what we talked about, and I'd welcome anyone who's interested in more on this to reach out to, to Elena uh, and see how, whether it's the San Diego work or other work, how we can be useful in, um, in starting work like this uh, around the country, because success here will be measured only at scale. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Alicia? Okay, I think you can see my slides, perhaps. Okay, 
Uh, I'll be quick and brief as well, as I know with a five minute presentation, we are supposed to be anyways. Um, I do want to recognize the partners involved in the Zero Hunger Pathways project that I think are on the call. Uh, so Asma Latif, who's with Bread for the World Institute and the SDG Advocacy Hub as well as Basil Dar, who's with Texas A&M University. We've worked alongside um, Caroline for the past year as well. Um, so this particular project also launched out of last year's uh, networking meeting uh, just prior to the shutdown. Um, so we have developed, let me go full screen actually, that would probably be good. There you go. Um, we have developed a model that is guiding uh, the Zero Hunger Pathways project. And I'm gonna work from the outside of the model in to describe the approach that we are taking. Um, the initial three months were probably spent um, talking with many different experts and many different stakeholders, trying to figure out what are the, the values uh, important in a pathways project where we're trying to break through that 10% that um, of, uh, prevalence of hunger that we faced in the US um, for the existence of the US. We've never gotten below that. And so what can we do in order to break that floor uh, and actually get to zero hunger? And so you'll see on the outside of this uh, schematic, the four values that we developed. So equity, resilience, sustainability, and healthy. Um, so we're looking at both food security and nutrition security through a lens of equity, resilience, and sustainability. So how do we utilize those values in order to move toward a zero hunger pathway? And so that's what you see in the next layer, um, which is uh, kind of in the schematic as the three bubbles, so policy, social and technical. So similar to the zero carbon group, we are focusing on policy and technical aspects as well. Of course, those look a little different than some of the energy um, policies and are very different from the technical um, uh, pieces that come out of the zero carbon work, uh, but looking at innovations and policy recommendations that can support these values and in accomplishing zero hunger. Also from a social perspective, looking at media and communications and behavior change that may be important from the individual and community levels to support uh, the policy and technical aspects. So how do we accomplish those policy, social and technical aspects? That's through engagement, education, research and advocacy. And so those are the action items that we'll take in order to meet the values, accomplish the approaches in order to get to the zero hunger pathways. Um, so that's a bit about our approach. Um, to make it a little more concrete, what are we doing right now in order to work toward um, that particular uh, end goal of a zero hunger pathway? Uh, we're conducting a situational analysis where we're looking at the multitude of reports that come out around food insecurity and nutrition uh, insecurity from a variety of stakeholders, but looking at them and uh, synthesizing them through the lens of academics, which should be more, uh, should be less biased uh, than some of the perspectives that are presented in some of the hunger reports coming out. Where are we right now? There's lots of data. We've heard all about COVID uh, throughout these past two days and uh, throughout the past year. And so we know that's really influenced food security numbers. So where are we right now? And why are we in this situation? What historically have been the causes and the consequences and potential solutions? Um, and we also are simultaneously holding a dialogue series that will launch in the coming weeks. Uh, where we have a cross-disciplinary group of experts who will brainstorm and respond to and prioritize the policy recommendations, technical recommendations, and social aspects that are important for the roadmap uh, with a view toward ensuring the policy and science inform those recommendations, that we can still kind of stay true to those four core values and we move forward with very action-oriented outputs. So our breakout session was actually yesterday. 
um, will be reporting out uh, in a bit. Ozma and Basil will be reporting out, but we welcome any of you to join uh, this particular working group that has interest in the areas of food and nutrition security with also an inclusion of the trade-offs. So of course, taking into account all the SDGs um, that are not just specific to SDG two, but in totality. Thank you, Alicia. And now on to Florencia and Lucia. Great. Do you have the slides? Perfect. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Florencia Librizzi, Head of Program and Partnership at the ESP Academy, and really a pleasure to uh, connect with all of you today and yesterday as well. Um, I have some updates for the SG Academy, and then I will pass it over to uh, my colleague, Lucia. Um, so as you know, the SG Academy has uh, strived over the years to create and curate high quality content on the SGs available to a wider audience, um, to really everyone everywhere. And since our main mechanism is the online education, we are well positioned to support faculty and learners um, from around the world, but also in the US where we have is one of the 10 uh, top countries uh, where our learners come from during these uh, dramatic times of uh, COVID. Um, we have seen a 3.2 uh, growth in enrollments uh, during this time and uh, have reached over 600,000 uh, learners uh, from 193 countries. So, um, and this is through our 35 edu um, massive open online courses, as well as over uh, 1500 uh, video lectures that we have our, in our library. So Car Caroline, if you can go to next slide, uh, you have there the links to our content and uh, which is clearly relevant to the topics that we're discussing and uh, to particularly the US reality. So please, if you don't, you haven't checked it out yet, please do use it and share it. Um, since the time is limited, I want to focus today in, in three concrete um, updates. One uh, being, and the next slide, please, our new and exciting um, initiative, which is Mission 4.7. Um, this is really the type of uh, partnerships that we need to uh, build in order to uh, advance the SHS, SHS 17 call us. And um, the Academy is a proud co-founder of this high um, level initiative to promote global uh, education for sustainable development uh, along with SESN Youth um, Global Schools uh, Program, the Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizen, uh, UNESCO and the Center for Sustainable Development at the University of Columbia. And um, really the idea here is to uh, be able to do high level advocacy, knowledge transfer, as well as um, mobilization of the resources to educate uh, for sustainable development and really realize uh, a target 4.7 um, for all, across all of levels of education. I think this is very relevant to the US, of course. Um, so please stay tuned. Um, the second update, please, if you can go to the next slide, um, is our community of practice. Um, we have um, launched our community of practice uh, last September um, after uh, many successful years with the university partnership program and working with universities on how to incorporate our resources in the different programs. And um, really we have seen that having these circular conversations such, such as the lovely one that we had yesterday in our breakout rooms are really beneficial to everyone and we can identify the challenges, the opportunities and um, also be able to identify opportunities for co-creation of resources, curation, and customization. So right now in the next slide, you will see we have 44 institutions from 24 countries from around the world. And we hope that you will also consider joining this uh, group to continue this type of uh, conversations. And finally, uh, my next uh, slide, uh, I really would like to give you an update about, oh, sorry, I, I did thought that I had a slide, but uh, on the book club with Jeffrey Sachs that we launched a couple of weeks ago, um, that's fine, there's no slide. Uh, so um, Jeffrey now hosts a, a book club and a podcast series, and the podcast will be um, launched in two weeks. Next week, we're going to have the second of these wonderful discussions with um, Richard Rothstein uh, on the color of, color of law. This is a wonderful book that really explores the origin of racial segregation in the US and explained how the decades of discrimination policy really had to do uh, with um, legal issues, not just facts, right? So please join us. This will be a wonderful conversation. And without further ado, I would like, like now to pass it to uh, my colleague, Lucia. Thanks so much. 
Hi, good afternoon, everybody from New York City. Um, that's where I'm at. But yes, I am, we're hosted within the SCSN SCG Academy, and I represent the MDP Secretariat, which is the Masters in Development Practice Secretariat, or the Global Association of MDP Programs. Um, to date, we have about 38. Um, oh, I think it's the slide before, Kara, Caroline. Um, I think we have about 38 universities, um, yes, thank you, that are part of this association and we launched in 2008. So we're always looking to expand this association, meaning these are uh, academic institutions interesting in offering a graduate degree program on sustainable development. And this degree program is really based on the four pillars is what we call it, pillars of social, natural health and management sciences. Um, it's a two-year program, it's face-to-face, -face, and some are uh, a hybrid or, on, or totally online. But one of the things that I want to bring to you and know that it is available because to create you know, an MDP program or a graduate degree program is not something that can be done overnight. But if you're interested, I did send my uh, contact info or, and the website um, on the chat. Um, but for those who want to get involved in what we do, um, I'm offering you this Global Classrooms. It's a course that we offer free every September to December, 14 weeks. It starts at 8 a.m. Uh, to 9.15 uh, every Tuesday. And the first day this year will be September 7th, I believe, to December 7th. So there is a website um, to this course, uh, which you can just send me, you know, contact me, Lucia Rodriguez, and I'll send you that website. And we have all kinds of, you know, lectures, videos, even sil a syllabi that's available. Um, and, and this syllabus that we have available is not you know, that you need to implement it as is, but for you to take it and localize it. So this is really what I call it, it's a gift, it's free, it's for you. Uh, we welcome you. If you're interested in also being a guest speaker, we have Jeffrey Sachs, for example, who's the guest speaker, who has, who's been the guest speaker for the past um, years on this, and he's one of them, one of many. But if you think you can be a guest speaker, who, and this is a course that reaches globally, we, you know, the majority of our MDP programs are USA based, or not the majority, but we have about nine of them that are in the US, so we have a lot of Americans participating in this course. But, um, if you are interested, it's there for you, and I welcome you. Thank you. Thank you both, and now over to Gavin. Okay. I hope you all can see my screen, Caroline. Confirmation? Okay, great. So this is a flash talk, so if you don't look, It'll be gone in a flash. <laughs> uh, I will be keeping it at five minutes. Ready, go. Um, okay, we all know that local governments uh, specifically have, have some challenges that are really large that they deal with. They often have capacity and bandwidth issues and they usually need thought partners, which is why they hire consultants oftentimes. Um, higher education also has some things that they deal with. We have a lot of experts, but they're siloed. We also need real world and experience uh, training for our students. And we also have a desire to make an impact. So that poses a problem. So we thought about a question. What if we could connect existing courses and other structures to single local governments over an academic year to work on projects identified uh, by those local governments and do them at scales that, um, that magnifies the value for all, which is why we developed the University Alliance. University Alliance puts people at the table face-to-face -face, building relationships across a large siloed institution um, where they typically would never meet. And the common interest is we are interested in cities. Where else will the Data Science Institute be sitting with the law school and the Population Health Institute and the School of Education? I can tell you emphatically nowhere in our campus other than the University Alliance. Uh, we subscribe to a particular model, which is an, uh, a group that you all can look up. It's called EPIC, Educational Partnerships for uh, Innovation in Communities Network. We try to exist, uh, respect existing administrative structures, both on the higher ed side and city side. We want to have a genuine partnership with, a, with actual MOUs and contracts that guide our work and that hold both people's feet to the fire. 
we intentionally aim it at uh, improving communities, which is where the SDGs come in. Um, projects are, as we said, community identified and evaluated based on the contribution to the community, not whether or not students learn a lot, whether or not communities actually get something beneficial. And I know that's a little controversial for our higher ed student learning folks out there, but we focus on community benefit. Um, and also uh, they're multidiscipline and usually large N numbers, which is kind of a fun, you know, another way of thinking about Epic N. So what exactly is the university year program? What is the program that we develop that is our EPIC model program that the University Alliance runs? It's a four-step process that happens over three years. Local governments basically identify issues and challenges that they want us to work on. We match them with projects, uh, project-focused courses. Uh, the students actually create some sort of concrete deliverable for these local governments. Um, and then we also try to help them think about how do you move these ideas into action and implementation. We have worked with uh, this many partners right now, but we actually have 14 partners in total. We've just added a few this coming year. Um, and you all can see large, small, some of these places you know, Milwaukee, some of these places you have probably never heard of, Egg Harbor, um, Greene County. Um, these are large uh, small urban and rural communities. We have completed 185 projects. We've had about 1300 students involved. We've engaged 80 courses from around the university. Almost every school um, and college is represented in the types of classes that we present. So let me just give you a few examples of concrete projects that we've done. We have implemented a mental health navigator program in Greene County. Uh, our toolkits for teen interventions for alcohol drug addiction are being used by Greene County. And also we helped them apply for a grant which they secured um, to create data sharing across different um, departments within the county. Uh, projects that align to goal seven, we always have uh, communities who want to work on sustainability issues. Um, and we've completed an energy audit and alternative energy designs, which resulted in solar being installed in a rural school in Wisconsin. And the lowest energy cost is costs on record for Judah School, which is a small school of only about 250 students, K through 12 total. Goal 11 projects, we always have people who ask us about affordable housing. So we engage our real estate program um, to do affordable housing site analyses. Um, and uh, we are looking at how to implement rural pocket neighborhoods in some of the communities that are more rural that need it, and also in some of the more rural, or sorry, urban uh, communities who also need it. These are just some examples. You can see some of the cost calculations uh, that our students do in their final reports. So in summary, can students do something productive for communities? Yes, I should add an asterisk here, as long as they're overseen by faculty members. Uh, can activities help communities make progress on the SDGs? Yes, I've already shown that. What's needed for this to be successful? Structure, and that's what the Epic End program invites. Uh, come to our breakout session, implementing SDGs in collaboration with cities and communities. This is my contact information. I'm done in a flash. Back over to you, Caroline. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And Alex, over to you for the final flash presentation. All right, hello everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. All right, so we're running short on time and I find that the most valuable aspect of these convenings is actually the opportunity to talk to each other. So I'll be short. So I used to direct New York City's Global Goals Program for a few years and I created the concept of the voluntary local review, which is why I'm here talking about volunteer, voluntary reviews. So first, I'd like to uh, thank Tony Pippa at Brookings and like white cis men in general for taking all of our ideas and hard work and endorsing them so that when they're asked to be keynote speakers, they can spread our ideas more broadly. Thank you. I won't repeat his points, which are of course my points that he's echoing so we can dive into discussions about cooperation using the framework of the global goals. So voluntary reviews are how the world communicates about the global goals. Since 2016, countries have been reporting their progress through a process I created, which uh, I was doing while I was directing New York City's Global Goals Program that I termed a voluntary local review. And hundreds of cities around the world now have committed to doing their own report. So with 
uh, CMU's Voluntary University Review, we're demonstrating the important role that universities play in achieving global goals, which is, a, of course, a team effort that included faculty, staff, and students. So what we did is we took a snapshot of education and research and practice activities. We mapped them to the 17 global goals in order to figure out what the level of activity was. And we conducted this analysis through a combination of desk research and engagement with the CMU community. We don't claim to have a comprehensive inventory of all activities at CMU. It's just the start of an ongoing process that will continue to develop hopefully with input and cooperation with all of you that are doing your own processes in your universities. So it's an iterative process that involves some level of subjectivity, especially since these goals were developed for countries and not for universities or cities or other entities. And so while many activities relate to more than one goal, what we did was we assigned a single goal to a single activity in order not to skew the analysis for the initial assessment. So for education, we looked at courses offered in spring 2020 as a one semester sample. For research, we tapped into Dimensions, which is a beta version software product that tags research publications with the SDGs. And for practice, we looked at activities like operations and community outreach and diversity, equity and inclusion initiatives so that we could better understand how CMU's operations were contributing to the global goals. And to complement the information that was collected through the desk research, we also engaged the CMU community through various outreach efforts. So the biggest undertaking was the 17 Rooms Initiative, which is a concept that was developed by the Brookings Institution and the Rockefeller Foundation. So for two weeks, we had 17 one-hour Zooms for each of the 17 goals where we asked students, faculty, and staff to share what they were currently doing to address that particular goal. And that uncovered a lot of missing links that we didn't know about before. We also looked at student organizations and marketing and communications and how they were talking about issues that were related to the global goals. And of course, throughout the process, um, we engaged representatives of the city of Pittsburgh with civil society groups, foundations, and other universities, including SDSN, to figure out um, how we could better improve our process and how we could share what we were doing to learn from others. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. And um, it's been so wonderful to hear from all of you. And, and I, um, I'd love to have had the chance to have longer presentations on each of these topics because um, I think it's really fruitful. So I'll stop. Uh, yammering on here and, and um, encourage everyone to please join the breakout sessions. Uh, we're going to post the links on the chat right now. Um, there are three sessions that will be happening simultaneously. And then uh, for those of you who are hosting the breakouts, we're still going to try and come back together at 3.30 so that we have the maximum opportunity to um, have a discussion as a whole group. So um, the, at 3.30, we will hear reporting out from each of the breakouts from today, as well as the four breakout sessions yesterday. And then from there, have a, have a open conversation about where we as a network have the opportunity to contribute across all of these uh, team, themes of interest for each of our members. So with that, please go forth and discuss. And I look forward to seeing some of the breakouts.